So what's the problem, buddy? Man, I, I was supposed to leave my connect group tonight, and I just, I just don't think I'm that guy. What kind of guy do you think you need to be? Well, you know, strong and confident. Uh, I just, I just don't think I have it in me. You have everything you need. What do you mean I have everything I need? Do you have like a, a super soldier serum or something for me? Not at all. I've got something much better than that. The Holy Spirit is going to give you all the strength and confidence you need. Is that really going to work? It already has. Thanks, Steve. stand with us this morning. We're so glad you're here. Happy Easter. Celebrate the resurrection this morning. But no matter what's going on in our lives, God is always good. God has paid for everything. He'll lead the way. That's why he's worthy of our praise. So if y'all sing with us this morning. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. Praise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody Come on I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roll. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive.
dark times, he is always there. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in
Yeah. 
light it up If you can light it up Oh God of revival The hope arrives Death is overcome Yes, you already won Oh God of revival Come awaken Come awaken your people Come awaken your city Oh God of revival Pour it out, pour it out Every stronghold will crumble I hear the chains in the crowd God of revival God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. I hear the chains hit the ground. Oh, God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. God, that's our prayer this morning. God, that you'll show us how to love you and how to love others most of all, Father, that we are responsive to you, God. You'll revive our city, our nation. Most of all, God, start with us. Let us be responsive to you, God, and let us show the love to others that you have shown us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your sacrifice. In your holy name, amen. You may be seated. I'm Luke. I have a wife and two kids. I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. I work for the Air Force as a software developer, and I'm excited to share my story with you today. So, uh, my dad's a pastor. Um, I've always gone to church. When I was, I guess, seven or eight, we moved to Virginia, and my dad started a church. So, ever since I was a kid, I mean, we traveled around singing in churches. So I grew, up, I grew up with church, and I, I got baptized when I was like nine, nine, ten years old. I don't remember a time where I didn't believe in, in Jesus and who God is. I just walked away a few times, you know. So I guess the f first time uh, I like majorly walked away would have been my junior, junior year of high school. I got, um, got my license recently, so I had all the freedom I could I could want, which is dangerous, <laughs> you know, for someone so young. And so I started drinking, hanging out with the wrong crowd, and that kind of continued through my senior year. Things got pretty bad. I almost didn't graduate uh, just because of kind of trouble I was getting into. And then joined a band. We traveled for a while. I did that for like eight months. And towards the end of that, the partying and stuff was just kind of getting out of hand. God finally got a hold of me and kind of changed directions. I quit the band. Had I not walked away, um, I don't know when I would have, you know, turned back to God. So I, I did the band thing, came back to Christ, right? Um, but then it didn't take long before I was kind of back into my old ways. I still wasn't taking my spiritual walk as seriously as I should. I met my wife during that time. I joined the military, and then uh, almost six years of being in the military um, before I got deployed for the first time. I was deployed to Qatar. From Qatar, I went to Afghanistan. And the first night we were there, we were sleeping. And a couple hours later, we get woken up. Uh, the alarm's coming in. There's indirect fire, which is uh, like a mortar, a mortar or missile attack. So we hear the alarms, we feel the explosion. It wasn't until I left that I realized or found out how close some of the explosions were. So at the start of the deployment, I had already made the decision, like I'm gonna use this time while I'm away from my family to get closer to God. I guess the big thing that the explosion did for me was God kind of pointed out, hey, you know, you're, you're, you're seeking me and it's great, but you're still holding on to some baggage and you need to give it to me. God can change you now. You don't have to wait for him. He's waiting for you. What an amazing love and his relentless pursuit. That is why we're here today. That is what we're here to celebrate. Jesus tells a story and says, Thank you. 
appreciate that, Cliff. Okay, let's try. Um, hey, there's a story in Luke chapter 15. Okay, I am cursed, okay? We are just, hey, John's coming up, and maybe this will go better. Okay, let's close our eyes. We'll start again. Okay, Jesus tells a story in Luke chapter 15, and he says, If a man has a hundred sheep and one gets lost, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go after that one until they're found? And then when he finds that sheep, he brings it back, and there's a celebration. That is what we're here today to talk about. We are celebrating the fact that everyone in here, every one of us, we were those lost sheep, and praise God, Jesus found us. Amen? And that relentless pursuit sent Jesus to the cross so that our sins would be forgiven forever. That relentless pursuit sent him to the grave so that he would have victory over death and we wouldn't have to be afraid of dying. And that relentless pursuit rose him from the dead so he's resurrected. We have eternal life and we have life to the full on this earth. Is that good news? Okay, you're setting the tone for the whole day today. Is that good news? Amen. That is why we're here. This is not just good news. This is amazing news. And I want to make sure that we get this out there to a lost and hurting world. So let's pray for that today. God, we just thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you. It's been two years since we could come together in person and celebrate your amazing love and the fact that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us, and he is risen. And we just celebrate that resurrection today. God, I pray for anybody in here that's lost. God, if there's somebody that has that is lost, that you would just find them this morning. I pray for the 99 that are in here today, that they would run out of this place and share this news with everybody that they come in contact with. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Oh, this is such good news. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, when you came in today, you've got a bulletin, and I just wanted to draw your attention to a few things in there. We've got our announcements. Uh, we've got some events coming up in there. We've also got our four ways to give, which is online, text, or in person here, or through the app. We've also got connect cards in there. We would love for you to fill these out so we can know who you are, so we can pray for you, so we can get you into a small group. Uh, I'm Steve Boston, forgot to tell you my name, and and I wrote it down, and I still forgot to tell you my name. There you go. And I work with the Connect Groups here, and we say life is better connected here at Center Point. so I'd love to get you plugged into that. Uh, but just please fill that in. Uh, fill this out and then drop that on your way out the door. Uh, we would love that. Also, you've got some sermon notes. And I'm just telling you, you need to buckle up. John's had two years to get ready for this sermon, and I got to hear it Friday night, and I got to hear more this morning, and you better look out. This is going to be amazing stuff. He is about to bring a message about truth, hope, forgiveness, and love. Happy Easter, everyone. We are uh, continuing on in a series that we entitled Investigating Easter, and we're answering some questions. The last couple of weeks we talked about why would anybody want to murder Jesus anyway, and we talked about that he had some rivals. He stood against political corruption and religious hypocrisy, and the people who were into political power and into religious power, they wanted him out of the way, and they found a way to get Jesus crucified. And then the other question we talked about last week was, well, well, if he knew all these corrupt people were going to crucify him, why did he allow it? And he allowed it because he wanted to, that was the only way he could pay the penalty for my sins and yours. And today we want to answer an important question. Does it really matter if Jesus rose from the dead? Because we live in a time, and I had a conversation just recently again with somebody. They go, look, John, I know that you guys have Easter celebrations. You talk about Jesus rising from the dead at your church and all those things. But I just think there's lots of ways to God. I mean, this is important for you to believe that. And I'm sure that Christians believe that. But other people don't have to believe that. I mean, why do you think, why do you think people have to believe in Jesus? And then he rose from the dead. I mean, is it really that important? I mean, it's important for Christians, but why do other people need to believe it? I go, because it really happened. I mean, it really happened. When we talk about Easter Sunday morning, we're not talking about a myth or a legend. We're talking about an actual historical event where Jesus rose from the dead. And if that is true, and it is, well, then that changes everything. And today I want to unpack for you some of the reasoning why. 
I mean, it sounds kind of wise, I guess, and uh, really sensitive to people to say, well, it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. No, it matters if we believe the truth. And my friends, we have God's word. We have the truth. And this morning, I want to remind us of the truth. I want to remind you how much difference it makes that Jesus rose from the dead. Will you pray with me, please? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good news that we have to proclaim today. We thank you that Jesus literally rose from the dead. And Lord, I pray that today you remind us again why that matters and why the whole world needs to know this. And Lord, that you would fill us with hope and joy and peace because of this good news. We pray these things in the wonderful name of Christ our Lord, who rose on Easter. Amen. Well, first of all, I want to remind us that Jesus really died on a cross. He really died on a Roman cross. Those enemies I was talking about, they really wanted him dead, and they worked together with Pilate, the Roman governor of Israel in Jerusalem at the time, to make sure that Jesus was executed. Now, after he died on that cross, here's what happened next, according to John's gospel. The Jewish leaders, the same people who wanted him dead, well, they didn't want the bodies hanging there the next day. Jesus was crucified together with two notorious criminals. And the Romans were experts at crucifying people. They would nail you to a cross. And uh, if you handled things correctly in a Roman crucifixion, people died in incredible pain over a long period of time. That was their goal. The Romans ruled a big way they kept power was to rule out of fear. And if you could execute people that were insurrectionists or troublemakers against the government or murderers or other things, a great way to control crime and rebellion was to show people if you rebel against us, we're going to nail you to a piece of wood and we're going to let you die over hours and sometimes days in agonizing, agonizing, screaming pain. That's what Jesus did. And the Jewish leaders wanted him dead, but they also had a big celebration. It was Passover time, kind of like we think of Christmas or Easter for us now uh, or Thanksgiving, a big family time when family gets together, and it just really ruins the party if there's people screaming in agony, dying in the background. So we got to get rid of that. And that's what was going on here. So the Jewish leaders didn't want the bodies of these guys hanging there the next day, which was a Sabbath and a very special Sabbath because it was Passover week. So they asked Pilate, this Roman governor, to hasten their deaths in, by ordering that their legs be broken. You, know, you stay on a cross until you can't push yourself up to breathe anymore. The hardest thing is to breathe. And so if you break people's legs, then they die in a few minutes. And so um, <clears throat> the, then their bodies could be taken down. So the soldiers came and they broke the legs of the two men crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water flowed out. Now, this report is from an eyewitness giving an accurate account, and he speaks the truth so that you also may continue to believe. Now, I just want you to know that um, the whole idea here that this was from an eyewitness account so you can also believe is important. He really died on a cross. And if you wonder, well, and sometimes people talk about this, well, yeah, John, I mean, I know you believe it, but it's not like there's any archaeological evidence of this. There's tons of archaeological evidence that the Romans crucified people all over the place. There's even a skeleton that was found in 1968 in uh, East Jerusalem. Some um, contractors were digging, and they came across a tomb accidentally. And what you're seeing on the screen here, on your screen right now, is uh, an ankle bone with a crucifixion spike driven through it. Apparently, when they pulled the man off the cross... The nail came out, and so they just left it in his ankle bone. They found the tomb. This was a man who'd been crucified. There was even an inscription on the tomb, so they know what this is all about. And what's also interesting is the man's legs had been broken, just like in this story. Now, am I telling you that this was one of the thieves that was crucified with Jesus? No. What I am saying is this isn't some crazy legend that has no basis in history like the Romans never crucified anybody. They crucified thousands and thousands of people. And this, in this tomb are the bones of a man whose the description of his death would have been very much exactly like the way the 
thieves dies next to Jesus. Jesus really died on a cross. Now, it's also important for us to understand that Jesus' body was really buried in a tomb from Friday evening till Sunday morning. After he died, his body was taken down and placed in a tomb. And by tomb, you don't think a casket like we think today. It's a small cave carved into the side of a a hill or a cliff where a stone could be rolled in front of the opening. There'd be shelves on the sides where family members think like a family crypt and they could put multiple bodies in there at various times when people died. Well, here's what happened with Jesus' body. As evening approached on Friday, Joseph, a rich man from Arimathea who'd become a follower of Jesus, went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. I mean, you had to be pretty wealthy to hire somebody to carve out a cave for you to make a tomb out of it. And so he asked for Jesus' body, and Joseph took his body and placed it in his own new tomb, which had been carved out of the rock. Well, then he rolled a great stone across the entrance uh, and left. Now, both Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, these are two of Jesus' followers, two women, who were sitting across from the tomb, they were watching. Well, the next day on the Sabbath, which is Saturday, the leading priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate, and they told him, Sir, we remember what that deceiver once said. They're speaking of Jesus here. While he was still alive, after three days, I will rise from the dead. So we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body, And then telling everyone he was raised from the dead, if that happens, we're going to be worse off than we were at first. And Pilate replied, well, take guards and secure it as best you can. So they sealed the tomb and posted guards to protect it. Now, I think this is just so important here. And I want us to understand this is one of those strange little twists that reality brings into a story. I don't even know how you'd concoct a story like this because... One of the objections, or one of the one of the objections to Jesus' resurrection, I should say, or one of the things people point out, they went, well, you know, these women that went to the tomb, we're going to read about that in a second. They went there and they found it empty. Well, of course they did. They just went to the wrong tomb. I mean, that's how you explain that. How would you explain the empty tomb? Well, they just went to the wrong one. But that's not possible. Well, how do you know? How, how are you sure they knew which one was the one to go to? It was the one with all the soldiers in front of it. There weren't many other people they were worried about getting out of their tombs. The one with all the guards in front of it, that was Jesus' tomb. And the two women who go to the tomb on Sunday are these same two who were there and saw where he was laid. It was also the one where the guards were. So, yeah, they knew which one. So what's ironic about it is if you wanted to give a perfect marker And to make sure that nobody misunderstood which was the right tomb, this was it. The other thing is, I mean, they were worried about this story getting out. That that if somebody stole the body, they could say, well, Jesus rose from the dead. People had already believed he was the Messiah, and they mistakenly thought that meant he would be a political leader. But they said, that's bad enough. But if he rises from the dead, they'll believe Jesus is the Son of God, and that's even worse. And these same guys who wanted the guards posted... If the women had gone to the wrong tomb and said Jesus was resurrected, well, then all they would have had to do is refer to the guards and say, hey, step out of the way. Let me show you where Jesus is and produce the body. I mean, that's all I have to do to shut that down. But you'll see in a minute they didn't. What I'm trying to relate to us is this really happened. This isn't myth or legend. Well, Christians believe that, but other people don't need to because it's not like any of this ever really happened. Yeah, it's like it really happened. This is real. This is a historical event. And that's why it's so important. Now, on Easter Sunday morning, so Jesus really died on a cross. He was really buried in a tomb. And on Easter Sunday, Jesus really rose from the dead. His body wasn't there. And we know that because the Bible tells us some women went to Jesus' tomb and an angel told them that Jesus had risen from the dead. People hadn't stolen his body at all. Now early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, same two women, went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, sat on it. His face shone like lightning, his clothing was as white as snow, and the guards shook with fear when they saw him. And then they fell into a dead faint. 
Then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Just as he said would happen. Could we say that phrase together, please? Just as he said would happen. I need you to remember that, because when we're talking about the significance on this, that's terribly important. Come and see where his body was lying, and now go quickly tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And so the women ran. Now, it's important to note on this that those same, so the women said that he had risen from the dead, an angel had told them this. Well, what did the guards say? And that's important, too, because Matthew covers that, that the Roman soldiers who guarded the tomb were bribed to say that Jesus' body had been stolen. I mean, there was a counter story that was circulated. As the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and told the leading priests what had happened. And a meeting of the elders was called, and they decided to give the soldiers a large bribe. They told the soldiers, here's what you must say. Jesus' disciples came during the night while we were sleeping, and they stole his body. Now, if the governor hears about it, we'll stand up for you so you won't get in trouble. So the guards accepted the bribe and said what they were told to say, and this story spread widely among the Jews, and they still tell it today. Well, how do you know they're not telling the truth? Well, that's an obvious lie. Why is it obvious? We fell asleep, and while we were sleeping, the disciples came and stole the body. So you were asleep. Yeah, well, then how do you know who stole the body while you were sleeping? Like, when I'm asleep, I don't know what you're doing. That's why we have that little weather alert radio thing on the phone, you know, because I don't want to sleep through a tornado. That would be terrible. Okay? While I'm sleeping, I don't know what's going on. How on earth could they know what was happening while they were sleeping? The other thing is, these are trained Roman guards, and this was a huge stone. These stones weigh hundreds of pounds. It takes several men, probably a pry bar, just to move the thing. And in one of the other accounts, we find the stone wasn't just rolled away. It was tossed away, like way over there. So you have all these guards, and they're sleeping so soundly, they don't hear a giant rock being moved and thrown away, and then a bunch of people carrying a body out. How soundly do you guys sleep? I mean, it's impossible. And that was the story that was circulated. But the angel told the women, no, no, this is what God had planned from the beginning. This is what Jesus said would happen. I mean, this event happened, and we know it happened because the next point in your outline reminds us that Jesus' disciples of more than 500 people 500 others interacted with him after he rose from the dead. It wasn't just that the tomb was empty. It's that people actually saw Jesus. They touched him. They spoke to him out loud. He interacted with them. Listen to what the scripture tells us. We've been talking about early Easter Sunday morning. This is later Easter Sunday night. Jesus, the, the disciples are gathered together. They've been hiding. They saw that Jesus was arrested, beaten, and crucified, and they didn't know if the Romans were coming for them next. So they were together in a place, and they had all heard all these rumors from the women that morning. And then Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said, but the whole group was startled and frightened. I mean, he came in, the doors were all locked, and somehow Jesus was immediately in their presence. And they were thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why, aren't, why are your hearts so filled with doubt? Look at my hands, look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. I mean, he still had the the scars from the, where the nails had been placed in his hands and in his feet and where the spear had been shoved into his side. He said, you can see it's really me. Touch me and make sure I'm not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. And as he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet and still they stood there in disbelief filled with joy and wonder. And then he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it as they watched. And we all know that ghosts don't like fish. No, that's not the point. That's not the point at all. No, that's not the point. Ghosts don't eat. He said, look, I'm real. I have really risen. And it wasn't just to these disciples. Paul wrote later on in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus was seen by Peter and then by the rest of the 12, the disciples. And after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at the same time. 
This wasn't the disciples just kind of having wishful thinking. This was 500 people seeing him at one time. That's three times as many people as are in this room all at one time, and he was interacting with them the same way I'm interacting with you now. And he was touching people, talking to people, interacting with them. This was no hallucination. I mean, this is astounding. I mean, it's the reason we gather friends and relatives to a wedding. This is the biggest commitment we're going to make. And so in front of God and witnesses, we make these vows. I mean, that's what goes on. People realize a long time ago that marriages can sometimes get tough. And somebody go, well, I don't know if I really married that. Oh, yeah, we were all there. We saw you. Now get back in there. God and witnesses. These are 500 at one time. And these weren't just 500 people who saw that somebody made a pancake with a burn mark on it that looked kind of like Jesus and they were selling it on eBay. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about these are people who interacted with him. And I go to all this length to remind us that this really happened. Jesus really rose from the dead. Could we say that together, please? Jesus really rose from the dead. Now, that's important. I want to give you three reasons why in this next section, why this matters so much. But we can't talk about this, that it only matters for Christians, I mean, historical events matter because they actually happen. Landing on the moon matters to everybody. I mean, either it happened or it didn't. And it's not okay to say, well, you believe what you want, but it really doesn't matter. Yeah, it matters. The Holocaust, there are people who deny that the Holocaust happened. Well, does it really matter? Yeah, it matters. This, if this is a historical event, and it is, then it matters. And here's what, um, first let me read what Paul said about this. If Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless and, all, and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. And if Christ has not been raised, well, then your faith is useless and you're still guilty of your sins. And in that case, all who've died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, well, then we're more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, and he is the first of a great harvest of all who've died. He's the first of a great harvest of all who've died. So I want to go over three reasons, and they're all kind of contained in that paragraph there. First of all, because Jesus rose from the dead, we don't need to be afraid of dying anymore. We don't. Because Jesus rose from the dead, it proves that he is stronger than death. Because Jesus came out of the grave, we can be confident. He said, anyone who comes after me, though he die, yet he will live. Because Jesus knew the way out of the grave, when we die because of our faith in him, we will rise from the grave. And that's what Paul said. He said, look, <laughs> if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then your faith is useless. Because you're putting your faith in a dead guy. I mean, people will say this. Jesus was a great teacher, and I believe all that. I just don't believe he was the son of God. I mean, he was a good man, and what he taught was true. It's like, no, remember he said that he would rise from the dead? Well, if he didn't rise from the dead, then he was a liar, or he was deluded, or he was crazy, and he believed something that wasn't true. But he wasn't a great teacher. He was just wrong. But if he really rose from the dead, and he did, well, then I don't need to be afraid of dying because of my faith in him. Then I'm going to rise too. In fact, here's what Jesus himself said in Revelation 1.18. I am the living one. I died, but look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death in the grave. I have the keys. I grew up as a farm kid in Kansas, and not far from my dad's farm, about six or seven miles away, there was a small college, and they had a basketball gym. And, uh, and so when I wanted to go play basketball, I'd meet some friends up there, and one of the guys that we'd play with, his dad worked at the, uh, at the school and had keys to the gym. And we had to wait till that guy got there because he had the keys. No keys, you can't play. Well, who has the keys to the grave? Jesus said, I died and I'm alive forevermore. You don't have to be afraid of dying, guys. I got the keys. 
I can let you out of the grave and let you into heaven. And if that's great news, would you say amen? Now look, I, I want you to see a picture of Ron and Lee Pass. They've been involved with our church for years. Uh, Lee is in her early 80s, and she is at home on hospice care. What you can't see on this picture is just to her right over there um, is a hospital bed in the middle of their living room. Ron is with her. She won't be with us next Easter. Um, she got a diagnosis a few weeks ago that some, due to some scarring in her lungs from years ago, it's all catching up to her now. And she won't be with us much longer. And I went and talked to her the other day when I took this picture. And I said, how do you feel about Easter, that Jesus rose from the grave and that he's got the keys? And she goes, oh, well, I'll tell you why that's good news to me, because I don't need to be afraid of dying. And she said, you know what the best part about that is, John? If I'm not afraid of dying, then I can get on with living. And she has a bucket list of all these people that she's calling and telling them she loves them. They have a connect group, and because she has to be particular about you know, protecting her lungs and other things like this. They can't meet in person, but they meet by Zoom. And her connect group brought her presents on her 83rd birthday just a few weeks ago. And they set them at the front door, and then they all got on Zoom and sang her happy birthday. She talks with her kids and her grandkids. And she said, I can focus on living and praying for people. I mean, she's going to be watching this today. I said, can I quote you on that? And she goes, and she said, oh, yeah. And she said, John, it's important, too, because, you know, I have one advantage over you. And I go, what's that? And she said, well, I know that I'm going to die soon. You don't know when you're going to die. John, you might beat me there. <laughs> I said, back up, Lee. I didn't come here for that. <laughs> but she's right. And, you know, whether I'm going to be able to live to 83 or not, I don't know. But you know what I can know? I can know that Jesus rose from the dead and he's got the keys to the grave. Amen. Now, if this really happened, and it did, I'm following him. Then I don't have to be afraid of dying. I can't wait to see my mom and dad again. I can't wait to stand next to the Apostle Paul in the presence of Jesus. Oh, I want the whole world to know this. I hope you do too. This isn't just for Christians. This is for everyone. Jesus died so the whole world could come to him. Not just people who grew up in the United States. Oh, we have to believe this. Secondly, because Jesus rose from the dead, we can be confident that all of our sins have been forgiven. Jesus said this. He said, this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It's poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Jesus died on the cross to forgive me of my sins. He said that. Well, he also said he'd rise from the dead. And we talked about this before. If he didn't rise from the dead, then he was either crazy or a liar. And he made promises he couldn't keep. Is this another one he couldn't keep? If he couldn't rise from the dead, how do we know he paid for our sins? And Paul says... He didn't. He was just another guy that made promises and he died on a cross. But with his own blood, the writer of Hebrews says, not the blood of goats and calves, those have been the sacrifices in the Old Testament, Christ entered into the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest, Jesus, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. And then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand, good for all time. Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid for all my sins once and for all. And I am grateful for that. And all of that he proved because he rose from the dead. He proved he has the keys to the grave. He proves that he is good to his word. And he proves that he paid the penalty for my sins. And I want everybody to know that because they can come to him no matter who they are, no matter what they've done. And maybe you came here today and you've been balled up in guilt and fear and shame. Maybe you came here today and you're, you have grief over something you did in the past or grief over something you're still doing. Well, come to Jesus. He forgives all sins. He holds the keys, the keys to the grave. He paid the sacrifice for my sins and yours. Come today. This is what we're talking about. And finally, because Jesus rose from the dead, then we have the power to live new abundant lives. 
Paul said he's the first of a great harvest of all who have died, but now we have eternal life in the name of Jesus. Paul even said this. He said, it, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for those of us who believe in him. It's the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. What's he talking about? He's talking about what Jesus promised. I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world can't accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you, and he will be in you. The Holy Spirit. Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, too. He promised he'd rise from the dead. He promised he'd pay for our sins, and he promised that the Holy Spirit would come and live in us and change us from the inside out and give us the desire and the power to do what pleases God. And if he didn't rise from the dead, then he can't keep those other promises either. And Paul says, we're more to be pitied than all fools. And John Schmidt is just a blowhard. Now, you may think that anyway, but please understand the reason I'm making this impassioned plea is because this is all true. Without the Holy Spirit, I have no power to be a new person. But with the Holy Spirit, I can be changed forever from the inside out by the power of God. He gives me, he empowers me, he equips me to serve him. And our whole next series that's coming up this next month, we're going to be looking at what God did through the early Christians in the book of Acts. You've got to come back for this. It's going to be amazing. And Jesus said, I've come, they might have life and have it to the full. To the full. On the screen here, you're seeing the new facility we're building over here off of McQueen Smith Road. We could have put these, uh, this footage in earlier during announcements, but I wanted it right here because I wanted you to see, first of all, the progress here. There's a parking lot, the steel's going up on the structure that's being built there. You get a pretty good idea of the layout of the place. The reason I want that is every time you drive up and down McQueen Smith Road, I hope that you'll be praying for us as a church that one thing will always be present, that every square inch of this building, every minute, every time we're together, Every time we're together in that building, every time we're together in a connect group, every time we're having a worship service or any kind of meeting there, that the name of Jesus will be lifted up. Because Jesus literally rose from the dead. And so he's stronger than the grave. Jesus literally died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. Jesus promised us the Holy Spirit. He has made good on that promise. All who come to him, we can surrender our lives and the Holy Spirit will fill us and empower us and change us. And we want every square inch of that building devoted to proclaiming that and discipling people every time we get together. You've got to pray for that. That building is going to be a great asset to help us spread the news. And why would we spend all that money and all that time building a building if it wasn't true? It's true! Let that sink in. When the women came to the tomb that day, they remembered everything that Jesus said. And the angel said, it's true. Go tell people. Will you pray with me? Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for Easter. God, we haven't been able to gather like this on Easter in two years. And God, I'm so grateful. I'm grateful for a building that's coming up. It's going to be amazing, but it's just another tool that will help us tell more people about Jesus. And I pray we'll tell the whole world. God, this is not an abstract concept. I thank you for Lee and Ron Pass. Lord, they're not living in a theological discussion. She is living hour by hour, day by day, knowing that her death will soon come. And she's not afraid because she trusts in Jesus, the one who conquered the grave. He has the keys. Convince us of these things. Convince me of these things. And God, I pray that you will use us as your people to spread this news far and wide. Anyone who's burdened with guilt and shame can come to you. You love them. You, you paid the penalty for their sins. Anyone who's afraid of dying doesn't need to be afraid anymore. You hold the keys. Lord, there's power to change. You promised it, and you keep your promises. It's true. Mm. And finally, if you're here today and you have not surrendered your life to Jesus, I'm going to pray a simple prayer right now. 
a prayer of surrender, and I want you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, please forgive me of my sins. Oh, Jesus, please save me and make me new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can follow you and serve you the rest of my life. Lord, I want to shine your light. I want to show your love and spread your hope. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. My life is not my own. I give it all to you. I want you to be first in my life. I surrender my life to you, Jesus, today. Oh, Father, thank you that that prayer is real. And you hear it, and you will answer anytime we come to you. Convince us of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. We have some volunteers, some prayer volunteers. They'll be up here at the front of the room. If you just said, hey, I, I made a decision for Jesus, we, why don't you come talk to one of them? I'll be out front. You can talk to me too. If you have a burden today about anything, remember, Jesus keeps his promises. He says to bring our burdens, come pray. But I want us to celebrate this Easter and worship. And Nick, we've got a great song of worship. Please stand now and let's worship him together.
Amen, amen, amen. There we go. Amen. Hey, we are so glad you are here today. Isn't this amazing to just be back in worship, celebrating our risen Savior? Just want to remind you, we've got prayer partners in the back. If you surrendered your life to Christ for the first time, we would love to pray with you. If you've got somebody that you know is lost, we'd love to pray about that as well. Cards, if you'll drop those off and your offering in the boxes on the way out. Y'all have an amazing day. We hope to see you next week for our series in Acts. Happy Easter.